I am Sudhir Pandey and again I welcome you to Ahmedabad University. Uh, today uh, on this topic we have uh, uh, Pranay Kotasthane with us. He is a Deputy Director of Takshila Institutions and uh, Pranay current, Pranay's current research include high-tech geopolitics and the politics of radically networked societies. He teaches public policy, international relations and public finance at Takshila's graduate and postgraduate programs. He co-writes uh, Anticipating the Unintended, a newsletter on public policy ideas and frameworks and co-host Pulia Bazi. Most of you may be familiar with this, a popular Hindi-Urdu podcast on politics and policy and technology. He has co-edited India's Marathon, reshaping the post-pandemic world order. A very interesting concept that he promotes and he wants to popularize. He, he calls it societism. The idea that society like market and state has a distinct role in any human community. And Pranay has contributed many opinion pieces on this and essays in several Hindi and English outlets. And we are very happy to have you, Pranay, at Ahmedabad University. Uh, welcome again, and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pranay. Uh, with Pranay, the, uh, uh, the uh, in-house professor who will be in conversation is Professor Momita Rai. Uh, she earned her PhD from George Mason University recently. Uh, she obtained MA in economics from George Mason. Before that, uh, she did her MSc in economics uh, from Madras School of Economics. And uh, her research areas uh, are uh, applied microeconomics, ex experimental economics, behavioral economics, and political economy. Before that, she has also worked at uh, I am Bangalore. So it is a pleasure to have you, Momita. And uh, I request you to take this conversation uh, forward. Before that, uh, as you know, the rule is that everybody will be muted, all the other people except our both the speakers. And uh, we want you to put your questions uh, in the everybody's chat box so that while the conversation will be on for the next 60 minutes, uh, we can take your questions, curate it. And at the end, during Q&A, uh, we'll put your questions and that will be answered. So thank you so much. And uh, you may please take it forward. Thank you, Sudhir. Thank you for the introductions and thank you for conducting the polls. I think uh, those are some really interesting poll responses. Um, welcome, Pranay. I, uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I think, uh, if I may say, semiconductors pretty much rule the world today. Nobody can say that, uh, you know, they, they, they can't deny their existence in their life. So uh, I'm sure this is going to be a very exciting and interesting conversation. Uh, so my idea for this conversation was to talk about the semiconductor industry with a special focus on India. But uh, before that, to start it off, if you could just give us a little background about the semiconductor industry, especially for you know, like laypersons like me, uh, that would be a great help. So if you could start. All right. Yeah. Thanks so much. I'm so glad to be here, especially at Ahmedabad University. Uh, have heard so much about the university and glad to be talking to you all. I also know there's a test match going on. So it the fact that you are here only means that either you hate cricket or you are confident that India is going to lose. So either way, um, happy to be here. Uh, to begin with, I thought, like Momita mentioned, uh, I will just briefly take you through some details about the semiconductor industry before we jump into the geopolitics of it. Um, I think there are unique things in, a, in its supply chain, in the way it has uh, evolved. So uh, I thought it would be a good intro. Uh, so let me just share a screen, my screen. I will quickly take you through, uh, pardon for taking some time on this. Yeah, I guess this should be visible. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah. So as uh, Momita mentioned, how semiconductors are really important. So I would say that it's the world's most important industry that you never thought about gen in our gen co common conversations. And I feel that it's the rapid advances in semiconductors are really a feat of human ingenuity uh, and also of human organization uh, uh, at all. And I'll tell you why. Um, and uh, any advancements that we talk about today from, you know, from the defense space to iPhones to anything, uh, semiconductors underlie a lot of those things and especially how the industry has evolved has a lot to do with it. 
So uh, really briefly, I'll begin with what they are. Right. So semiconductors generally refers to the material used, which is uh, commonly silicon or germanium. And why it is called so is because its conductivity is in between insulators and conductors. Right. So that's why semiconductors. Uh, and the really the superpower that exists is uh, there is that you can actually control the flow of electrons in a material in such a kind of material if you design it in a proper way uh, by using another controlling current. Now, when you can do that, you really have a superpower. You know, you can convert that particular uh, design into an amplifier, into a switch, into something that can store a value. So it really unleashes power that no other material can, right? So that's really the basis of why semiconductors are important. This idea that you can control current based on another controlling current in a particular material, right? So uh, that, that's where the story of semiconductors starts. And uh, broadly, I will just tell you about this. If you see what's on your screen, uh, uh, most electronic components sort of will have semiconductors and non-semiconductors. So, uh, for example, sometimes you would have uh, transformers, you would have batteries, they are not semiconductors, but apart from that, everything else is semiconductors. And within semiconductors also, you have different kinds of semiconductors. So you have LEDs, LED is also a form of semiconductor, which is an optoelectronic uh, semiconductor. There are discrete transistors, there are sensors in your cameras. And then there are these four on your left. And these are really what we call as ICs, uh, integrated chips. Now these are uh, integrated circuits and these are really important because uh, currently, if you look at the entire value chain, they account for 80% of uh, the entire semiconductor sales, right? So whatever I'm going to speak from now on and we are going to discuss about is actually about ICs. Uh, and colloquially, people call them as semiconductors because they occupy such an important role. Uh, now, uh, the really interesting thing was first you had this uh, idea that people thought you can convert semiconductors into uh, transistors and those transistors can do basic things like I told about amplification. They can You can convert it into a switch, you can con uh, convert it into something which are logic gates and function, not function, whatever, right? That was the beginning of it. Then people uh, in 1950s was this great uh, thing which came out, which was the uh, IC, right? And what we are talking about that uh, uh, the idea there was that you could combine several components and functionalities on a single chip instead of having them uh, on a motherboard and then you are going to connect it with wires. So that was really, uh, that unleashed the powers because you could pack lots of functionalities in an IC. Actually, I have an IC, so yeah, you would have seen this kind of IC uh, in many of your devices, right? So uh, these, uh, th this was a Nobel Prize uh, winning in invention, of course. And then uh, there was something which came to be known as the Moore's law, right? And uh, Moore's law is actually not a law. It is just an observation based on how the technology was advancing. So what the Moore's law stated was that uh, roughly approximately every two years, the number of transistors within a dense integrated circuit would double. Okay, so that was uh, the observation. It was based on a historical trend. It was not a law. But the surprising thing about semiconductor industry is that that sort of observation has held true for nearly 40, 50 years, you know, so that's really something which doesn't happen in any other industry, right? So, I mean, you take of the, uh, think of the LPG cylinder in your house, it's not as if its performance increases by twice every two years, or you can think of any, uh, your car mileage doesn't improve uh, by twi twice over every two years, but I see the performance could improve by every two years. And the way this performance improved was that you went, you started packing more and more uh, transistors and uh, semiconductor material and functionality within an IC. So just think of it when this uh, Moore's law was sort of uh, mentioned at that point of time, 
an IC had around 64 transistors. Okay. And today an Apple A14 chip has 134 million transistors per millimeter square. So, I mean, just look at where we've gotten from where we started, right? And that's that's really the amazing part uh, of this particular industry. So, uh, in fact, at that point of time itself, in 1965, when there were 64 transistors in a uh, chip, um, uh, Moore's uh, Moore, uh, Gordon Moore was would later became the CEO of Intel had mentioned about how their ICs will lead to these wonders called uh, home computers and automatic controls for automobiles and things like that. And that was 1965, right? And sort of all the things came true at some point of time. Uh, and uh, also uh, think of it this way that the uh, an inkjet printer at our homes now is has more computing power than probably what NASA had when they launched uh, 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 their missions to the moon. You know, that's where how fast and how forward we've come uh, in the semiconductor industry, right? So uh, uh, because of this particular uh, advancement and the way it has happened, uh, we expect something very different from this particular industry compared to what I talked about, say, cars or uh, your uh, other fuels, right? So that's something unique. Now, why did this happen, right? As I told you, it is just an observation, right? It was not uh, a law as such. So what has really happened is one uh, inventions, innovations in the pro products and the materials itself. But the other big reason why this has happened is the unique supply chain. Uh, and uh, I always think that if someone has to teach uh, economic concepts like division of labor, comparative advantage, globalization, I think semiconductor industry offers a great case study for explaining all these. And the way it happened is this way. So I'll just briefly talk about the supply chain because that's really the uh, core of where the geopolitics is playing out. So if you look really broadly uh, about manufacturing a particular IC, uh, it passes through these broad uh, stages, all right? So uh, first stage would be uh, R&D. So this will be a really capital and skill intensive stage. Uh, where you would actually try to uh, uh, evaluate test chips. You will try to see whether you are able to uh, achieve a particular functionality with uh, lesser number of, uh, lesser amount of power consumption, or are you able to increase the speed uh, at a particular, uh, that let's say your games that you play on your phone, are you able to uh, play them uh, with the performance that you require? or let's say you are able to get a camera processor which can make uh, uh, which can sort of work at uh, at night time so various kinds of things performances that you want to optimize for you are going to first see whether your material is capable of doing that whether you need to uh, go to lesser and lesser sizes to pack in more performance in the same space that you have on a phone, right? So that is essentially what the R&D stage does. And uh, the industry-wide uh, investment rates, it is it is one of the most uh, R heavily R&D in uh, intensive industries in the world. Uh, almost 15 to 20% of the sales goes into R&D, right? So uh, that is one. The second part is design, right? Uh, so this is a very human capital intensive stage where uh, companies will conceive of new products, they will conceptualize new products, uh, they'll make specifications which meet customer needs. So Apple might come up to a semiconductor company and say, you know, I want uh, this phone to have so and so features to be able to play X, Y games to be able to have so many megapixels of camera. So you would uh, get together, a company will design uh, the particular uh, processor which will be able to meet this uh, specification. In Apple's case, uh, Apple's own semiconductor unit would do that, but generally uh, it can be outsourced to others as well, like it happens in automotive industry sometimes. Uh, so design, uh, basically, you can imagine if you have 134 million transistors on per millimeter square, obviously you can't do this by hand. So there are specialized software for this, which are called EDAs, uh, Electronic Design Automation. So 
there are companies for it and then you have intellectual property companies which actually give you uh, uh, cores, uh, processor, uh, blueprint of processors, which you can then convert uh, into a design. All right. So that's the design. The next stage is manufacturing. Now, this is again a very capital intensive uh, industry, and you need huge upfront costs for this. Uh, so this is where the uh, actually your blueprint of your design gets finally converted into a physical chip. And obviously, this requires you uh, you to have uh, semiconductor materials. You need to have the uh, process which is used for this requires extreme amount of cleanliness. You can imagine, you know, uh, uh, a single strand of hair will occupy many many more transistors than the size of the transistor. So even if you have one hair falling or one dust particle falling on a chip, its functionality is totally lost, right? So you need to have uh, ultra clean environments, all those costs really high. Uh, like today, if you want to manufacture chips which go into your Apple phones uh, and uh, the processors, you need upfront costs are around $12 billion, right? So what 80 to 85,000 crore rupees. So that's the kind of investment uh, required in manufacturing. Uh, and finally, uh, after manufacturing, you have assembly, test and packaging where you convert uh, a, a, a silicon wafer into what an IC looks like, right? So that's uh, the entire stage. Uh, the supply chain and uh, the assembly test and packaging is mostly labor intensive you would require uh, lots of people uh, who are able to do this assembly uh, and testing right so this is broadly how the supply chain looks like just to recap uh, design would be human capital intensive a lot of r d required there manufacturing would be a lot of capital intensive uh, functions and assembly and testing would be labor intensive, right? So that is broadly how we understand it. Now, the most beautiful thing that happened in this industry, and that's why I said comparative advantage, earlier, all these steps used to be done by a single company, okay? So one company like Intel would do all this for their processors, uh, right? And many other companies used to do the same thing. But you can realize that as uh, we started going towards the Moore's law direction, you had to improve that processes every two years, right? In order to get more and more functionality, more and more performance. And the only way you could do that was to improve your manufacturing facilities, right? And that again required uh, a new manufacturing facilities, new production costs, et cetera, right? So upfront investment, like I told you, is uh, billions of dollars and that you can extract advantage of it only for six, seven years. Then you want to go to the next node. The next node will pack in more transistors. So you need to do again, more upfront investment, right? So uh, you can imagine this was really, uh, cumbersome for any company to get involved. So that's when uh, something uh, uh, wonderful happened that uh, the comparative advantage, uh, the division of labor sort of uh, moved towards the fact that all manufacturing started getting done by through contract, right? So instead of a company having its own manufacturing unit, uh, contract manufacturers emerged in the 1980s uh, in uh, East Asia mostly, and currently Taiwan, which has the TSMC, uh, is probably the most important uh, technology industry company in the world now. Uh, and TSMC sort of does more than 50% of contract manufacturing. So whether it is Apple, whether it is uh, AMD, whether uh, it is um, many other companies and many other phones that you use, their processors would have been designed, contract manufactured at TSMC. Now, why, why this was important is because it, le it led to a really nice thing that you could actually, if you have a company, you could only focus on doing the design part. Right, uh, and that's what uh, came to be known as the fabless companies because you don't have a fabrication unit which is uh, required. So all the companies like um, you know Apple, Google, AMD, all these companies could just focus on getting their design right. 
and they didn't need to invest in manufacturing they didn't need to put money there they could just cre create the blueprints and then they could give it to contract manufacturing for uh, to a company like tsmc or uh, others in east asia uh, so you can imagine the upfront cost reduce a bunch of companies flourished the fabulous market sort of exploded there are fabulous companies across the world now but manufacturing is still concentrated in one region and in a really few countries so that sort of what became a bottleneck and i'm sure we are going to be talking about that a lot more but this is how uh, broadly it is um, and just to sort of again reiterate uh, there was to begin with there was this integrated device manufacturer basically one company doing all these functions over time you had this division where only some companies did design a uh, few companies did contract manufacturing and others did outsourced assembly and test again on contract again which is concentrated in east asia china taiwan south korea so this is how sort of uh, this um, uh, comparative advantage led uh, diversification happened and now this industry is one of the most globalized industries in the world in the sense that every ic would travel uh, four times across the world approximately because some part will get manufactured elsewhere when you would have uh, other parts being manufactured in another country and that's how it operates so until now this industry works so smoothly that we didn't need to know about it and we didn't need to bother about how it uh, all this fell into place things just fell into place until what happened in during covid 19 and what happened with us china confrontation so I'll stop here, uh, Momita. Uh, if we want to discuss more about this, we can otherwise. Yes, yes, this. absolutely. Uh, firstly, thank you for the great introduction. Um, you explained the supply chain so simplistically that it was very easy to follow. So thank you for that. And I definitely uh, would like you to continue on that. Right now that we have a basic understanding of the semiconductor semiconductor industry, if you could talk more about uh, how critical the industry has become in the geopolitical uh, geopolitics of nations, especially as you mentioned, uh, uh, with the US China, uh, intensifying US China technological rivalries, so if you could comment on that. And also, uh, where does India stand in all this? Right, yeah. So, um... Yeah, to begin with, uh, I really like this uh, quote uh, by uh, uh, Willie Shi at the uh, uh, HBS, uh, Harvard Business School. So he explained this sort of with an analogy. He says that the semiconductor industry structure can be thought of as a transcontinental relay race with hidden hurdles, right? So uh, think of it, imagine uh, this uh, sort of uh, industry and it is precisely that right so it is a transcontinental relay race you are manufacturing only a part of it and handing over to others uh, and there are hidden hurdles hurdles are there because uh, there are only a few companies uh, in, in uh, which are concentrated in a few countries which do one part of this entire chain. So if you are able to control those companies or exert influence on them, you can place hurdles in the path of another country, right? So that's what is essentially the geopolitical importance of it. Uh, now I will come to some specifics. Uh, as I told you, the contract manufacturing is uh, at the nub of all this because uh, all of this is happening in Taiwan and you all know already how US uh, China relations uh, and uh, especially in the Taiwan Strait uh, things uh, ha geopolitical tensions have been rising so there has been this threat that if China were to take over uh, Taiwan not because of semiconductors but for the political reasons, uh, semiconductors would just be a small reason for that. But if they were to take over, then uh, even the US loses out on a lot of uh, manufactured chips, right? So even some of their fighter planes, some of their top notch uh, companies are all manufacturing their uh, products through TSMC. So whether it is Apple, uh, whether it is Google, whether it is uh, even uh, Boeing. So some of these. Uh, companies which uh, are really critical for the US, they are all manufacturing in Taiwan and that's really the uh, problem 
in the present times. The second thing was uh, uh, there are increased cyber attacks uh, there are, uh, from China on TSMC, on Taiwanese uh, companies. So that's again a threat which uh, many countries are realizing. Right? So that's sort of uh, one angle to this. The second part is broadly, if you think uh, technology would be a big source of power in the information age. Uh, so, and uh, anything related to technology, one thing that will underlie that is advancements in semiconductors. So that's why I call semiconductors as being metacritical. And from that angle, uh, if you are able to stop a country's progress in this domain, or, or you are able to accelerate your own progress in this uh, domain, then you have uh, uh, an upper leg uh, in this particular era, right? Where uh, so much of our confrontation is happening uh, in the technology sector and not necessarily only through wars, right? So that's uh, that, that's one important point. Uh, the second uh, sort of thing that has happened is uh, over the last two years, there have been allegations about espionage uh, through hardware. So uh, there has been uh, two stories that Bloomberg had brought out, uh, which sort of talked about how uh, on uh, motherboards, uh, there were some chips which were put in by um, agents related to China, and they were trying to uh, uh, give that information back to uh, China, right? So now this is uh, heavily contested. Uh, many people think that that was not the case, but yet DARPA, the US Defense Department of Defense is investing a lot of money in improving the security of hardware. So it means that there is some uh, concern at least, if not outright espionage. The third part is that you can actually hurt another country's economy if you are able to deny access. So just look at what happened in the US-China case, right? So US, uh, China, or like US, manufactures a lot of its uh, it is, by the way, it consumes a lot of, uh, it makes the final product. So final products would be made. Apple iPhones could be made by a Chinese supplier, but they don't have a really good uh, semiconductor IC setup. So they would still do the final assembly, test, uh, integration, etc. But they wouldn't have the capability to make an Apple iPhone chip uh, in inside, right? So they, uh, a lot of Chinese companies are also reliant on uh, Taiwan. So what uh, the US did was they, it imposed secondary sanctions on uh, TSMC. Uh, what it said is that since TSMC uses semiconductor manufacturing equipment made in the US, so it banned TSMC from supplying uh, ICs to uh, companies like Huawei uh, and others, right? So that sort of was a big uh, blow for Huawei and their uh, plans have gone astray because of this, right? So this is just an example of how one country can hurt another country's economy. It has hurt their 5G plans, it has hurt their mobile phone business, uh, etc. right? So this is uh, uh, really the uh, important part on the geopolitical side. Uh, now, next, uh, you asked about India's role, right? So uh, India it has its own comparative advantage, uh, I would say. So uh, a lot of semiconductor uh, IC design process, which I talked about, uh, eight out of the 10 top semiconductor companies by revenue have their design centers based in India. So there would be, uh, and as I told you, it's a human capital intensive state. So you really require a huge amount of engineers who would know uh, the basics of VLSI design. And that's where our strength lies. So uh, um, in the semiconductors uh, sector, by the way, in India started way back in 1985 when Texas Instruments uh, invested in uh, uh, an R&D center in India. So it was one of the, uh, starting of uh, Bangalore as the uh, Silicon Valley of India, right? So it really started with the Silicon company, not with a software company. So that was where uh, it began. And India, over the last, um, you can imagine if a company has started in 1985, and over the years, there have been many people who have 
uh, worked in that industry, worked through the design cycle. So there is a lot of expertise on the design stage. There is also a world-class design services company. So just like you have IT services, uh, semiconductor design also has a, a services firm. So basically you do one part of the design for another company. So uh, India has many such companies as well. Uh, what is not there in India is the manufacturing side. Uh, and the research side. So specifically, because manufacturing is a capital intensive uh, sector, you only have a few uh, government run or you have uh, academia associated units, but they don't do uh, manufacturing at the cutting edge. Like I told you about in making an Apple iPhone chip or making an AI chip would be really difficult. But they, there is enough capability to do, let's say, do manufacturing of a chip for, say, space-related applications. So there is something called the SCL in Chandigarh, which does a lot of space-related uh, 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 chip development. Right? So that's broadly where we are. And uh, I hope I'm able to explain what the geopolitical uh, tensions are and how they have risen because of uh, semiconductors. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm glad you brought about the uh, part about how they, uh, these things can affect uh, the economies of other nations, because uh, there's something that I wanted to talk about is something which is making the headlines for quite some time is the uh, global shortage of chips. Um, in fact, I think uh, just two, three uh, days back, Martin Suzuki announced that uh, they're expecting, I think, uh, almost 40% uh, slump in their production, which is a very big number. And this is very concerning to economists. So I was reading that uh, economist uh, Rory Green, he compared the semiconductors and he called it the new oil, comparing the crisis now to the oil crisis of the 1970s. So uh, from an economic point of view, you understand that uh, this change in supply will have a massive impact on demand. Uh, so if you could comment on that, uh, these, uh, the shortage, the global chip shortage, how did this come up to be? And basically the geopolitics behind it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So that's uh, indeed. So the again, the core of all this is because of how this industry has evolved, right? So you have uh, an extremely globalized uh, industry, uh, which each company, few companies in a few countries being able to do parts of it, which means that in normal circumstances, it works fantastically well, right? All, so much, as I told you right at the beginning, a lot of the great things that have happened are precisely because of this structure, right? You can just do some part of it, be very good at it, and others can do some other parts of it. Now, that all worked fine un until and unless, until we realize that there is, the problem here is that you don't have a resilient supply chain. And if there are geographic bottlenecks, if there are geopolitical bottlenecks, then everything is thrown out of gear. Now, what happened uh, during the, why is there an automotive shortage is related to this, right? Um, again, think of it this way, like uh, the Japan earthquake and tsunami in 2011 was led to a rearrangement of, you know, global auto manufacturing chains, right? So uh, otherwise you had so much of things, sourcing and manufacturing was done in Fukushima and after that it moved out uh, to a lot of other places, right? Similarly, that similar thing has happened or being uh, because of COVID-19, right? So what has, uh, for semiconductors, now what happened specifically for automobiles was that once the, uh, the pandemic hit, uh, people expected that, you know, all the auto manufacturers that uh, people are not going to buy uh, automotives anyways. So they sort of stopped production lines uh, and the contracts that they had given to companies like TSMC for manufacturing their chips, right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, the demand for data centers, the demand for chips, which are required for laptops of mobile phones, all that uh, shot through the roof, right? Because all of us are on the phone and on the uh, on our computers through the day. Uh, so these two things uh, resulted in a situation that when the demand for automotive started picking up uh, earlier in this year again, uh, the entire contract manufacturing setup was not able to have space for these automotives at all because you already had an excessive demand for the other type of uh, chips which i already mentioned right and i as i told you it's just 
a few companies which are doing this on contract and they would prefer to manufacture those which have higher margins and the margins are higher for the cutting edge, edge chips right so they would prefer to manufacture a chip for apple or, or uh, let's say for huawei or amd rather than do that for automotives which are generally uh, old uh, trailing edge nodes which are which don't give them as much margin so that's what the essential problem is so there is no excess capacity in this industry to build excess capacity uh, like we discussed it requires huge upfront investment to get it up it will require one or two years so that's the situation that we are in automotive there is demand for uh, automobiles but you can't manufacture uh, the chips because there is no ex uh, supply uh, of wafers left for this particular process right you are just being occupied by other uh, other demands on this industry so that's what has happened now so broadly if you think of it uh, the way i thought of it is um, from an economics lens from a supply chain angle there are two kinds of risk uh, risks here right one was the concentration risk so as i said geographic risk, risk is definitely there that you are concentrated in Taiwan, in East Asia. So forget about uh, the geopolitics of it. But e recently we saw the, how there is drought in Taiwan and the semiconductor manufacturing requires huge amount of really pure supply of water as well, right? So uh, if there is something uh, which is a geographic problem there, uh, the entire world's, all industries are going to be hit in one way or the other. You know, so that sort of a concentration risk uh, that we face. Similarly, there is a business continuity risk, uh, which means, for example, if you have to manufacture a processor which goes into Apple phones, you require a very specific manufacturing equipment for that. And that is only manufactured by one company in the world, uh, which is ASML in uh, Netherlands. So now if something happens to ASML and they are not able to uh, supply uh, that particular machine, you know, they just make a few machines every year in tens, uh, not even in hundreds. Uh, that, that, and they're really, uh, you can imagine, really costly uh, machines uh, and very less demand for it. Only a few companies would want those. Uh, so if, if something happens to ASML, the entire uh, the product line, those shock will be felt through the supply chain right up to the mobile phone that you get, right? So that's how there is a business continuity risk. And the third risk that I already discussed is the geopolitical risk, which we are seeing now. Every country is sort of seeing semiconductors in strategic terms, right? So this word strategic is overused in geopolitics, and but uh, it's sort of being seen that we need to have our own semiconductor industry because of uh, see how unresilient or non-resilient it is, right? So that's why uh, you are seeing a lot of contestation to get uh, an equivalent of a TSMC or a manufacturing uh, uh, setup in your own country, right? So these are sort of some of these three risks. These risks existed before COVID-19, but the pandemic has sort of exacerbated it and it has highlighted to policymakers that, you know, there is this resilience angle, which we didn't care about earlier because things were hunky-dory, but now we need to worry about it in the changed circumstances. So uh, hearing whatever you've been saying so far, uh, so it feels like uh, to uh, for India especially, uh, to get about the geopolitical risk, it seems like it's better for India to be self-reliant. Uh, but from about the other risks that you're saying, uh, the concentration risks and others. So it seems that it's better if they work with other countries to build uh, the semiconductor industry. So what is the best way for India to go forward? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that is an important question, right? And uh, there was a poll also related to it. Uh, but I think the, the audience got it perfectly right, uh, I would say, because self-sufficiency would be perfectly desirable and nearly impossible is how i uh, think of it um, so uh, th again i have a good quote by uh, david edgerton who's a B british historian of technology and he sort of says that you know only in techno nationalist fantasies do we have national invention driving national economic growth 
most often in the real world it is global innovation driving national growth and national innovation driving global growth and that's particularly true of the semiconductor industry given how uh, globalized it is so what we've seen over the last few years is because for getting uh, an additional uh, um, performance for every uh, in every chip right the r and d costs and investments that you require are increasing non linearly you know so because now literally in uh, you have transistors sitting a few uh, atoms apart and so when you do that you hit lot of limitations of leakage currents etc a lot of technical limitations but essentially you need to put lot of money in order to get the same uh, performance improvement that you could earlier so what has happened is erstwhile national industries are uh, transformed into global supply chains like we discussed and each country just specializes in a specific part of this supply chain now uh, e even if we see uh, a country like us even though it has huge uh, massive fiscal resources it is spending in order to again have manufacturing facilities relocated to the us it is giving lots of subsidies uh, of various sorts and yet it is unlikely that us will be able to manufacture all the parts of the uh, supply chain to indigenize all of them uh, together right purely for cost reasons like uh, we discussed Uh, if you want to actually integrate all these ICs on a printed circuit board, that is an industry which is again uh, based on really low cost margins. So you would want to have it in a place where you have cost advantages, and it's not possible in the US. Many people have tried, uh, but it, it's just more advantages to manufacture it in Taiwan, in China, or elsewhere. So if, if, despite US putting in a lot of Uh, money attracting lots of uh, companies in this yet even they can't indigenize the entire supply chain so similarly india if given its uh, fiscal constraints won't be able to do that either right so uh, that's why uh, uh, just look at for example the r and d spending of tsmc alone it is 28 billion dollars this year uh, the capital investment in uh, whatever they are doing whereas india is also trying to attract uh, uh, attract semiconductor manufacturing here and the total outlay for the production linked incentives that we have is 1 billion dollars right so it, it's just uh, an order uh, of magnitude difference so what i would uh, i have been writing about and arguing for is we shouldn't be thinking of indigenization in the changed uh, technological landscape at all we should be thinking of ecosystems and not indigenization and what i mean by that is we don't need to have this entire supply chain in the country uh, i mean it one it would be hugely costly and the opportunity cost of those will be massive and even if we are ready to put in that money it's not necessary that these companies will come to india because Uh, and in the current situation us eu china all are doing the same thing throwing money at the problem so they would rather go to a country which is offering more money uh, has a sort of better enforcement mechanisms has easier availability of reliable electricity uh, water power rather than come to india right so uh, the idea is why would you want to do that uh, when these two challenges are there so uh, i think of it as india should rather have two strategic goals one uh, broadly we should have built enough redundancy in the supply chain such that no part of the supply chain is heavily dominated by china which is our major strategic adversary and the second goal should be that we need to build enough expertise in all parts of the supply chain uh, so that collectively uh, china could be outpaced so and i think to achieve both these two uh, goals we actually don't need full indigenization we need to work on our comparative advantage which is semiconductor design and if we can uh, sort of work on that it will be good and whereas a lot of manufacturing as long as it is 
in places which are not under china's threat so it's okay if it is in us if it is it's okay if it is in japan uh, as long as we are able to access them we don't need to worry about having them within india you know so that is uh, the way i think i'm not saying that we don't need to have semiconductor manufacturing facility in india we can have but we don't need to have the leading edge ones which cost 12 billion dollars and require upfront uh, investment repeated subsidies by government but we can think of the trailing edge manufacturing uh, facilities which are lower in cost uh, and which still will see demand uh, going up uh, ahead so uh, they are easier uh, they, are, they are easier to build we can build expertise in them and then think of doing the kinds of things that us and uh, uh, eu are trying to but i have also been reading your work you uh, in, in this regard you also make a case for a quad partnership for india right so uh, i mean continuing with this how is it suitable for india uh, you already mentioned about the competitive advantage and how can they actually uh, you know start this partnership and it's one thing to have that idea and another to you know to convert that idea into a, a tangible outcome so how would you how would you suggest they can do that right yeah so uh, essentially i sort of um, had this argument uh, as i told uh, you that it's probably better to think of ecosystems and not indigenization and then when we think of ecosystems where do we start was the question and the idea is that already there is a geopolitical uh, sort of alignment in a sense which is taking place that uh you know things need to be done to uh, confront the china challenge and the quad is sort of already moving towards that uh, so given that there is already an alignment of sorts to move forward uh, i thought quad would be a good place uh, for uh, such a kind of thing to happen and quad has already taken some steps in it there is a, a working group on critical and emerging technologies which currently has a really broad agenda but my point was why don't we start with semiconductors within that broad agenda uh, and how would it uh, sort of work out uh, the way i have said is uh, there are really uh, specific uh, parts of the supply chain where these four countries have comparative advantages in as well so us for example is a design behemoth uh, six out of the top 10 fabulous companies are there Uh, over 62% of global fabulous revenues come from us companies they are really dominated dominating in that part of the supply chain japan is a powerhouse in the manufacturing equipment material so the really pure materials that you require for this um, uh, and uh, the processes that you require etching gas uh, silicon wafers all are dominated by a few two or three japanese companies you know so they they have an advantage there Australia is a basic materials provider not so much in semiconductors but they have uh, silica deposits then um, they have a good mining industry which can be used for composite semiconductors and finally india has uh, is the human power right uh, as i as we discussed there is a lot of uh, semiconductor design development which happens in um, yeah 30 km radius from where i am sitting in bangalore specifically so uh, there are these advantages of that so you can see there are comparative advantages each country can plug in the gap that other country has in this uh, supply chain and that's why uh, and the weaknesses of each countries can also be compensated by the other so that's why i thought uh, quad is a good point for us to start Uh, and the way I, I think of it is, uh, you know, um, like L- Land Pritchard talks about isomorphic mimicry, uh, and the idea is that why would we want to do what US is doing? We sh- we need to look at what are our own problems and what are our own advantages. So given that we have advantages in design, why don't we focus uh, on that? Uh, you know, and the way I I, I would see uh, this happening is India focusing more on. uh the design front and on the trailing edge uh, nodes for manufacturing that is the older uh, manufacturing facilities which are cheaper and us uh, eu japan probably focusing on the more advanced one and as long as we have arrangements uh, and i'm sure we can talk about the gov- what governments can do about this but uh, as long as we can have arrangements so that 
companies in each other's countries can benefit from this uh, we don't need to necessarily indigenize this you know so uh, i i had started i the i had proposed that we begin with something called a quad supply chain resilience fund which essentially does three things which thinks of diversifying the manufacturing base so like i said do some uh, manufacturing in us some in japan some in india um, then do work on collectively work on new standards development a lot of geopolitics of technology is happening in uh, developing standards like how china got an advantage because their companies played a leading role in setting the 5g standard so similarly there are lots of manufacturing standards in semiconductor so if these countries can come together and uh, work collectively on new standards development they will have a, a upper hand in this and finally uh, you know if these countries can facilitate strategic alliances between the companies of uh semiconductor companies in each other's countries again it would be uh, a good start uh, you don't require indigenization you can build an ecosystem together uh, so i think we're nearing the end of the time so i'll ask my last question uh, which is what you were mentioning could you tell us a little more about how governments can uh, you know support uh, the industry if you have some policy recommendations yeah so uh, these are points that i'm still developing so i'm sure economists here would have uh, more insights into it but one thing that i sort of uh, the biggest conceptual shift in i think we require in our mind is to uh, is the need to embrace an allied approach in technology right like i mean we are still thinking of technology from the old industrial policy realm that you throw enough money at the problem just like we had a steel industry which came up in india if we throw enough money at the problem we'll also have a entire semiconductor industry in india which i don't think is the case at least the evidence doesn't uh, say that even us is finding difficult to so the way i would think of it is that it is important for governments to do what companies can't right instead of trying to do this idea of uh, throwing taxpayer money at the problem and anyways companies are better judges of efficiencies and comparative advantages than uh, country governments are so i would say specifically governments could do uh, some things so uh, international relations wise uh as i said uh, a lot of development here has happened through r&d cooperation across countries so you had uh, you have really uh, lots of licensing agreements cross licensing agreements technology exchange visitation and research development uh, joint development which happens uh, across geographies and if you think of it governments have a role to play in each of them right so for example uh, uh, if we remove technology transfer restrictions in the quad countries uh, we could uh, accelerate licensing and cross licensing agreements similarly uh, easier capital flows uh, could also have foster more joint development projects currently uh, investment screening norms in this industry are very high so if you could think of quad countries or quad plus countries thinking of lowering those investment uh, entry barriers then you could have a possibility of more joint development taking place right so these are certain things which only governments can do you know uh, companies definitely can't uh, so uh that's one the other thing uh, uh, a lot of work in this sector happens through intellectual property generation so you have a lot of uh, work on patent uh, regulation to do so if we could have you know uh, uh, harmonizing uh, things think of things like the patent prosecution highways which exists so uh, if there is a collaboration on that front uh we could again uh, encourage more joint development across these countries right so that's sort of from uh, uh, uh international relations point of view even domestically i think india can uh, think of uh, the lots of problems why semiconductor manufacturing doesn't happen in india is not because uh, specifically uh, because of the semiconductor uh, industry as such but the problems are wider right the uh, contract enforcement revisiting our export controls strengthening intellectual property protection i think these are the barriers which stop a lot of companies from uh, uh, trying to invest in india because uh, remember as i said there is a huge upfront 
capital cost that you need to put in and you're going to get results only five, 10 years down the line. So if you are not uh, confident of the contract enforcement of IP protection, then no country is going to take that bet. Unlike in a software space, where you could potentially move to another country quickly. Here, it would be very difficult to do. Uh, similarly, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, the disability in terms of attracting other companies uh, is broader, right? It is about taxes on fuel, uh, you know, electricity not being subsumed under GST and things like that, right? So in order to be more competitive, it's we have to go beyond just uh, throwing subsidies at this particular problem. Um, I, I, and the final thing I would sort of, uh, one thing that idea that I'm pushing for is if we want to have manufacturing in India, we should think of uh, the uh, trailing edge nodes, the older manufacturing facilities. It would be easier for India to develop expertise on that. And the fact that these nodes will still be important. Not every Thing that is manufactured requires uh, five nanometer technology, uh, requires huge capital investment. Even for things like 5G, you need baseband, which can be done on the trailing edge nodes. For most of the defense applications, most of the space applications, you can work on a trailing edge uh, node, right? So it's better that we invest in those. They, those, I think, are more strategic rather than thinking of indigenizing the whole industry. So that's how sort of I think of it at this point. Great. Uh, so I think we have uh, reached uh, the end of our time. This was very insightful and I really learned a lot today. Uh, so thank you, Pane. I think uh, I'll let the audience ask you questions now and we can learn more about uh, this. So I'll hand over to Sudhir and Sudhir, maybe you can take the questions. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Momita, and thank you so much, Pranay. We have a host of questions. So I would like to initially invite some people on the camera. They will come and ask their questions. So can we have uh, Soumya? Soumya has a question. In fact, she has several comments and questions. So Soumya, can you please uh, come on camera? and? So, so uh, Pranay, very interesting talk, and I, I know you have a background from this industry. So whatever you mentioned was you know, really insightful in this one hour. Uh, the question I had was that, you know, all these challenges you talked about in the uh, foundry, in the supply chain, and the uh, downstream processes are capital intensive. And let's say Taiwan and Korea and Japan have built up systems around that. So if you are in a quad uh, collaboration, you know, those pieces are taken care of. However, where India is very weak is always in upfront research. So when you had the supply chain, uh, you know, diagram where you talked of, you know, the design part as a second stage where, you know, there's a lot of these service companies like Cadence, Synopsys, you know, all the players who have big presence in India uh, doing all that. What we are essentially doing is global services, right? So the design belongs somewhere else. So how capital intensive, when you said 28 billion versus 1 billion, you know, product uh, PLI and all that, the point is TSMC is, you know, the world leader. So what they are investing in research may be very different to what, let's say, a country could start doing for, let's say, auto chips for, let's say, Tata's or, you know, whatever challenges they are facing. So what would be the research capex for doing something like that, which could place India at an advantage to be able to at least control the first two legs of the uh, IC supply chain? Hi, thank, thanks so much uh, for... The, your insightful comment. So, uh, yeah, the uh, if you think of this industry uh, again, uh, the design front already there are. Uh, it's not just services, uh, you know. So, uh, uh, Cadence, Cadence and Synopsis, the two uh, companies you mentioned, are actually EDA companies. So they manufacture that software which is used for placing this humongous amount of uh, uh, transistors on a chip. So they do a lot of R&D uh, work on that. Now, what uh, has happened is because there have been so many uh, uh, companies which are not Indian, but which have a wide experience of doing uh, the entire design cycle in India, working over the last 30 years, there is, I think, a critical mass of people who are uh, experienced in doing even the R&D design work. 
uh, and you are already seeing uh, beginnings of this there are a few indian companies which uh, have their own intellectual property in this space and it is beginning to pick up uh, i think what is stopping uh, a lot of this is i think it, this industry would require a lot of uh, patient capital to come in not just from the government but also from the private players so but we are seeing the be beginnings of this so an example i can give you is for example the government of karnataka has the semiconductor fabless accelerator lab now uh, and essentially what they are doing is they are uh, uh, developing uh, incubating a few semiconductor fabless companies they are giving eda licenses like i told you this software costs really huge amount and uh, it becomes really costly for a startup to uh, have these eda licenses so uh, what this safal is doing is trying to uh, give this uh, integrate the demand and give it to a few Uh, companies which they are incubating so this is a, a government led effort for example uh, which is beginning but I, i guess now with the realization that uh, this industry requires some resilience patient capital by the industry uh, would help us to sort of uh, improve uh, our capabilities on the design front as well now uh, so i think design is still is i see more possibly in the next 10 years you will see india incubated companies doing a uh, great intellectual property generation design work but on the research front which was the pre production stage that would require a lot of again you need to the pre production stage actually operates on optimizing the silicon itself so that requires much higher uh human cap uh, much higher uh, capital investment so that would require you to have fabs that would require you to have close interactions with fabs so there i see uh, uh, still a lot of difficulty but on the design front uh, i think india is poised towards uh, having many more companies which can do in house uh design and intellectual property generation and we are already seeing uh, a few companies incubated in india registered in india uh taking those first steps uh hi somya is uh, hello i think you have answered the question uh thank you so much uh, pranay and thank you somya uh now i would like to invite uh, professor amol agrawal he has several questions and a very interesting one uh, the last question is really interesting so professor amol uh, can you please come on camera and ask a question so pranay i'm obviously aware of your background uh, you were an engineer and all that but still uh, you know it was it was quite interesting the way you narrated this uh, semiconductor and i believe you were earlier working in the semiconductor industry as well is that right uh, and is that what drove you to this sort of research on semiconductor industry yes so i used to work for around 6 7 years uh, for two us companies based out of bangalore itself so I, uh, and i have seen r and d work happening uh, in india uh, but yeah back then our common complaint was in technology no one talks about semiconductors right like right. <laughs> everyone talks about software but uh, here we are in 2020 uh, the geopolitics as has moved towards talking about semiconductors yeah so i mean uh, since you uh, also look, looked at a lot of history in this uh, so i was just kind of curious at what point of time uh, did uh, all these industries you're mentioning uh, become so semiconductor involved i mean and uh, from i had no idea and thank thank god i heard this uh, talk today uh, it it was uh, quite interesting and uh, also worrisome that so many industries have become uh, kind of you know dependent on the semiconductor Uh, and uh, as you and some questions have also come that uh, the car companies and etc cetera, etc cetera, which we all thought that run on petrol and diesel but uh, you know are are basically running on semiconductors and there is a shortage there so 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 what i had is i mean some some thoughts on how did this uh, reliance uh, sort of on semiconductors start with the various industries any timeline you have uh, and uh, are we thinking about some alternate to semiconductors i mean is there some technology at work Uh, where you, we are since the shortage is happening it is resource heavy it is uh, it requires a lot of financial capacity so is there some alternative and uh, since you are also a foreign policy uh, kind of a person who 
So what kind of discussions are happening on the global front? Uh, is it a UN issue? Is it, uh, is it an issue where, you know, people are talking about it, that, you know, what is happening at the semiconductor industry? Uh, and uh, to sort of uh, look at lowering the risks of semiconductor. And my final question, uh, sorry for many such questions. Uh, my final question is, if you could, you know, point us to some readings on, on this. I think it's a very intriguing uh, industry and uh, some kind of primers and some interesting things. And, and the way you narrated uh, the, the story, maybe you have a thriller writing, uh, you could write a thriller for us explaining the geopolitics and the semiconductor industry, you know, uh, as we've uh, read so many of those thrilling thriller novels around petroleum and oil and, and we believe that semiconductor is the new sort of thing and maybe Pranay can write a book, uh, you know, educating us th through this. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, um, I'm also, I'll just go through the four questions. So there have been different dates where, uh, I mean, different eras where you had uh, this idea of uh, semiconductors being used uh, uh, in, in different industries. But the whole process has been that you replaced mechanical parts with electrical parts at different points of time. And then electrical parts got replaced by electronic parts, right? So when that stage happened in each industry, you were uh, at that point of time, you started needing semiconductors. So for example, uh, one of the first companies which did this uh, was Texas Instruments and Texas Instruments originally used to work on uh, geophysical oil exploration kind of work back in Texas and then they wanted to uh, have better uh, technology to uh, detect this and that's where you know sort of you started moving towards electrical and electronics and then semiconductors. Uh, also think of it for example in automotives now as you are moving away we are seeing a transition in place right as you are going towards EVs, uh, the uh, value of semiconductors in your entire uh, chassis will keep increasing. So it's similar uh, things have happened across different industries at different points of time, right? So that's essentially why you would need more and more uh, semiconductors. Second, you asked a very interesting question on alternatives. So yes, a lot of work is happening on that because the upfront costs, as I told you, are very high. So, And the more important point is you're actually hitting the limits of physics now. You can't, you're literally uh, a few atoms apart. Uh, each of your transistors are a few atoms apart. And that leads to a whole lot of uh, complications. So people are thinking, can you use things other than silicon? So there are a lot of advancement uh, research happening on using say composite semiconductors, which have slightly different properties. Uh, also uh, gallium nitride, which is used and that the cost of manufacturing the, those are arguably lesser than that of silicon. So, but a lot of this is happening on the research stage. So DARPA, for example, has funded a new program called the Electronics Resurgence Initiative in 2019. And a lot of it is focused on this. Can we focus, get alternatives to silicon? Can we improve? uh the security uh so that there's no espionage so a lot of that work is beginning uh, as we speak and i'm sure in the next uh, five ten years we'll see some alternatives coming up on the foreign policy angle uh i don't see any sort of un related efforts happening on this but it's mostly uh the same industrial policy mindset so a lot of countries are having government programs for semiconductors now so it began with china's make in china 2025 initiative in 2014 basically they offered a lot of incentives and you had companies food companies which are now uh, trying to manufacture semiconductors there uh, they have invested you know the government once you put money you can crowd in a lot of investments right so a lot of them have failed but you won't uh, anyways it's uh, people uh, so there is food companies coming into it there are uh, also local governments in china which have uh, invested in semiconductor companies so that crowding in is happening but the results are not commensurate at all so uh, a lot of investments uh, which are happening currently i see are of that kind you know each country trying to see what part of the supply chain can i indigenize so us eu japan india including all of them are doing that but uh, collaboration at this level is 
uh, not happened yet. Uh, I know in Europe, EU uh, has uh, funded a program to do this thing at the EU level. Uh, but not uh, EU, uh, US, etc. Those are just beginning. Uh, so, for example, EU is now trying to attract Intel to do a few things there, uh, so on and so forth. So, uh, it's bi bilateral initiatives have begun. Uh, multilateral initiatives, probably in quad, like I said, in the working group, uh, semiconductors is one of the things uh, for discussion, but no concrete steps at a broader multilateral level, and definitely not at like a UN scale. Finally, on readings, uh, there are very few books on this subject because the technical folks concentrate on the technical part, and you know, uh, the geopolitics is just. Uh, something which people are now focusing. But I would say there's a book called Fabulous uh, by Daniel Nemi, uh, and it talks a lot about what uh, I mentioned. And there's also a book called Tiger Technology. I think that talks a lot about how the East Asia miracle in semiconductors took place. Uh, so these are two books uh, I would recommend. There are a few good papers on this as well. Probably I can share a link uh, with uh, uh, but yeah, the space is limited. And yeah, I, I would love to write a book on this at some point. Thanks. Thank you, Amol. And thank you, Pranay, for answering that. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Praveen Tripathi. He has a question. So uh, Praveen, can you please uh, come on camera? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, a very, very informative and educative talk. Uh, my question is, uh, is success in semiconductor industry driven more by access to critical raw materials or is access to materials now reasonably democratized? But it is the manufacturing processes and design of chips which drive success of this industry. Which, which is a more important factor? I mean, all three matter, but which is the one that actually determines the success? Yeah, I think it's, it's tough for me to say, uh which is uh, more difficult because there are bottlenecks in all these you know uh, again raw materials for example uh, as i said the uh, that the rate of purity which you require are only manufactured by two or three companies um, i mean two or three japanese companies plus there will be others in the world but uh, they occupy 60 70% of the uh, and that supply chain. So uh, then uh, there are bottlenecks in the manufacturing equipment. I think that is a big bottleneck. Uh, as I said, you know, if you want to make an Apple iPhone processor chip today uh, and the manufacturing equipment, which will actually uh, uh, carve out the chips on the wafer, is just manufactured by one company in the world, right? So uh, manufacturing equipment is a bottleneck. Uh, manufacturing capacity itself is a bottleneck because of uh, contract manufacturing being so costly and being dominated by a few countries. Also, uh, please, uh, one thing that I didn't mention earlier, these manufacturing uh, industries are hugely environmentally polluting as well. So East Asia made that trade-off. You know, why industries moved away from the US, one of the reasons was also that the environmental costs were significant uh, and East Asia made that trade-off, you know, some countries that we will, uh, we will sort of try to mitigate those effects in other ways. So uh, that is another bottleneck that you still have these manufacturing capacity in a few companies in a very few countries. So that's uh, another one of bottlenecks. So uh, these bottlenecks, uh, the, I don't think there is a big bottleneck in the design front. You still have because fabulous companies exist widely across the world, that is not a bottleneck. But apart from that, uh, EDA companies uh, like Soumya mentioned, there are just three companies, all of them US, which do EDA uh, licensing. So if tomorrow US companies would to say that Chinese companies, you can't get any of our EDA licenses, uh, and then Chinese uh, companies will be really struggling. They don't have an EDA uh, equivalent like the other three. So there are these bottlenecks across the supply chain. So uh, it's difficult for me to say which is more, uh, which is more of a big bottleneck. But I would put raw materials as you know out of the three or four bottlenecks, definitely one of them, uh, and it still exists. Thank you, Praveen. And uh, 
we have a uh, lot of questions coming up now. So I would like to invite one of our students, MBA student Neeraj, who would like to ask a question. Neeraj, can you please uh, come on camera? Am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, uh, so Pranesh, uh, uh, I heard that N. Chandra Shekhar and the chairman of the Tata Group says uh, it's about to says the Tata Group is about to enter the semiconductor manufacturing business, and they already have a business high tech business set up for it, and that would unlock a GDP growth opportunity worth one trillion dollars, and also millions of job opportunities. So thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I, I think that's uh, 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 that's a positive sign, like uh, I mentioned, because now there's a realization that you need some resilience. Uh, it's good that there is some patient capital which is coming in in this. And uh, I would also like to see if there is some patient capital which comes in on the design side. You know, like we discussed, it's really a comparative advantage for India. So if some uh, uh, companies are backing uh, product companies which are doing chip development, uh, that might be really useful. Secondly, uh, yeah, if they are able to, if Tata's is able to get a manufacturing setup up, and uh, again, we don't need to manufacture iPhone chips. If we are able to manufacture uh, chips which go into 5G baseband, if we uh, manufacture chips which go into automobiles, which are not the leading edge ones, definitely, then uh, it would be a great start, you know, so uh, uh, there are beginnings of this. Let's see how, how it works out. You know, uh, I'm not uh, very optimistic because there such uh, promises have been made in the past and many times before. Intel promised one thing uh, way back in 2003, 4. There were a lot of talks, but because of cost and competitive advantages, co contract enforcement concerns, etc., it didn't pan out. Then there was a second a uh, big attempt at this where a consortium was formed uh, and they wanted to start a fab way back in uh, yeah again in 2010 around in hyderabad that also didn't uh, take off so this is i in my experience the third time we are seeing a, a big industry led effort uh, which is concentrating on it so uh, the idea is are, are we doing something different uh, i'm not so sure so uh, yeah so let's see how it works out Thank you, Neeraj. Uh, related to that, uh, there is another question by Professor Pallavi Vyas. So I would request uh, Professor Vyas to come on uh, camera and ask the question. Uh, yeah, this is really uh, an eye-opening uh, conversation because I had no idea that this was like, almost like as important as steel. Uh, you know, I mean, it, this is like the, our livelihoods are dependent on semiconductors. So I just had a question on leveraging the human capital that's involved in th this industry. Like, you know, the, I, I'm sure like a lot of the industry has in, uh, Indians working in it in the US and in other places, right? Uh, you know, can we leverage that somehow and uh, create some type of model of uh, communication with India to develop anything? Um, you know, I mean, I, I don't imagine that they would move back or, I mean, it wouldn't be easy unless, you know, like I just moved back from the U.S. for personal reasons. And I understand, like, you know, it's not easy. Like this, this transition is not easy and the pay scales will be just at another level over there. But just the knowledge and the know-how and because I know in economics, they're doing that, right? Like, I mean, Abhijit Banerjee, all of them have got funding for Indian projects, you, you know what I mean? Like, so is there something that is being worked on or can be done? Yeah, so yeah, I think uh, joint development is something that definitely has a potential. So, uh, uh, and I think governments have a role in it. Like I said, technology transfer regulations in this sector are high because every country yeah. is seeing it as strategic, right? So yeah, yeah. that's why uh, my argument is if we think of it as building a quad or quad plus or any other, I'm not hung up on quad, but just that this is a starting point. Uh, so if we can lower some of those barriers, I think a lot more cross licensing, joint development can happen. And uh, as you 
correctly mentioned there is a lot of indian uh, community expertise in this industry in the us in europe etc so definitely a, a potential to leverage uh, and you can see some of that happening in china like uh, a, a lot of people who have started companies in china in the semiconductor space are people who have come back from the us uh, so uh, I, i think returning back as you would better than me is also a combination of the fact that overall living standards overall uh, opportunities how do they evolve so in china that has happened and uh, i think if, if once that happens in india you would also see some people uh, relocating here but uh, definitely on joint development i see potential uh, if we can lower some of these barriers Hmm. Yeah, just uh, I mean, even if people, you know, I mean, I understand that people may not want to relocate, but I think every every migrant wants to give back. Like, there's just it's just in you know you not every, but I would say ninety percent, right? So there's so much potential. So what particular sector would you think that that would be possible? Like what was I mean, since semiconductor is pretty wide, like what particular area do you think that would be possible in? Um, yeah, so uh, I I wouldn't know. For example, what could be an economic instrument for it? Like, can we have a, a sort of a bond which sort of helps us make this uh, create uh, an industry back in India? Uh, but I think one sector which is really easy for joint development to happen is just the design part. So that's where you can. Uh, there is a lot of expertise in India because of thirty, forty, thirty years of this industry. So that can be leveraged definitely. So if there is some investment uh, backing some of the uh, smaller startups which are coming up in this space. uh by people in the us uh, i think that is something which is quickly doable and possible for thanks thank you uh, pallavi uh, now as uh, uh, it was said that you are surrounded by pranay you are surrounded by economics so now we have one ma economics student ayush who would like to ask a question ayush uh, can you please come on camera and ask a question yes uh, sure uh hi sir uh my question is uh, actually that uh, given the geopolitical situation as we can see now we are very much interdependent on each other and that's a great thing but uh, there is a sort of kerfuffle going on that uh, uh like in 2008 the crisis came lehman crisis and there was a ripple so can we be sure that we should not be or we uh, can Well, we should not be kind of uh, uh, very much self-sufficient in semiconductor industry, given that everything revolving technology is now uh, with semiconductor. So, can we be really sure that we should not be going in that uh, indigenous uh, project uh, way and uh, relying on interdependent uh, uh, market structure? I mean, if there is some shock uh, in future. we can be affected uh, so how should uh, we devise our policy in this regard yeah are you cool guitar by the way so yeah uh, so I, i would say yes uh, uh, we have to think of uh, what is strategically most important to us and probably think of narrowly uh, uh, sort of focusing on that now the way i think of it is if you think entire semiconductor supply chain is strategic there is no way how much ever uh, money we put uh, and with the opportunity cost also that we will be able to indigenize it i mean there is good practical reasons why even the us couldn't do it right there, there was re, uh, all these manufacturing facilities moved to east asia for very good economic uh, reasons you know so for us to be able to overturn the the those economic advantages just would require humongous amount of resources with no guaranteed success at all uh, second i would say but as you said that there are certain things that we would want to uh, be assured of so uh, what i would think of is in trailing edge nodes manufacturing for example if we are able to secure uh, say uh, chips for some of the most critical things that we do say space 
defense, etc. That would reduce one sort of dependency. But remember, even like defense sector, for example, uh, chips would be just one part of uh, a fifth generation uh, multi uh, MMRCA that you are going to have. You need many other components to fall in place for which you might not have the ex entire expertise in India, right? So you can probably uh, cover one part of it, but not the entire thing. So the the way I think is, I mean, you think of AI chip development, or if you think of any of the recent uh, technology industries, they are very globally uh, diversified. Uh, for example, a lot of AI research. Uh, re recent data suggests you know 30% uh, of the top papers more than 30% i think are generated by migrants who are in one country or the other you know so uh, there is really uh, this the, the new technology industries are in the form of global supply chains so to think of indigenizing that as a whole is sort of uh, to me it seems nearly impossible so better to have a narrower definition of what is strategic and then focus narrowly on that and play on our comparative advantage which for india in this sector is definitely designed so why not take that advantage get most of the countries in the world to manufacture any chip out of india right so if we are able to achieve that goal i think uh, we would have uh, uh, done well remember in this entire supply chain that i told you the value the maximum value that is captured is in the design cycle not in manufacturing you know because manufacturing again you have to uh, do a humongous amount of manufacturing you have to ensure a plant load factor of 90 percent or above in order to make profits so only few companies in few countries would be able to uh, do that but we already have a, a big uh, talent base in design so why not take advantage of that capture that part of the supply chain across the world we can make a lot more uh, economic sense through that need and we can have interdependence right others will be dependent on indian expertise as well so that, that's how i would see thanks thank you ayush uh, as i said that uh, we would be taking uh, 5 10 minutes of your extra so i have last set of couple of questions by ramanik shah uh, the first question is can india take lead in functional testing encapsulation and the assembly of products in semiconductor and the second one is a massive supply of a specific grade and quality of water is needed in fabrication of ics uh, any advantage of uh, india having it uh, from our vast himalaya range Please, uh, these are the two questions. So, right. Thank you. So, uh, just talking about the testing and uh, uh, the outsourced assembly and testing part, right? So, currently, as from my industry survey, I think there are around two or three companies in India which do this. But, uh, uh, like I said, one, it is labor intensive. Second, is there are low cost margins in this. So uh, what you would again want is, uh, uh, it's a chicken and egg problem here. Uh, most of the companies like in Taiwan has a really big uh, outsourced assembly and test business as well. The reason being that they are also manufacturing chips. So TSMC manufactures the chips and it is easier for them to then hand it off to another company which is located close early for doing assembly and test right because you need to be able to hit the cost margins and achieve so but if you have assembly and test in india without you having a foundry here the cost of transferring uh, the chips and then the possibility of in the transportation you would have some uh, misfunctionalities arising are high that will again lead to lower yields lower profit margins right so i think that's why a lot of people in the industry talk about whether you need to have a good foundry before having an assembly or whether you can have assembly which can profitably make uh, money even if the uh, chips are manufactured in other places so that's where the debate is now the government has introduced a lot of uh, subsidies for the assembly and test sector as well so uh, we'll see whether that sort of has any advantages but uh, what i am already we are seeing some higher level integration of uh, mobile phones etc happening in india so that's one positive side of 
the other end of the supply chain which might generate demand so samsung has a really big uh, integration uh, thing for their mobile phones in india similarly you all know about vistron and the other suppliers uh, foxconn trying to have uh, operations out of india for apple phone so that is beginning i think that might generate some demand for doing the next level of the supply chain in india which is uh, assembly and test but yeah i mean given that it is labor intensive we have some comparative advantage again in that uh, uh, but a cost disadvantage is just that we don't have foundry so you will have transport costs which will be significant uh, that was uh, one question uh, Uh, sorry what was the second one i sort of second forgot. one was about uh, i'll just quickly read massive supply of specific grade and quality of water is needed right. in the yeah right and there right. is another question by pranshu which is around the environment that how yeah, so this yeah affect the environment okay yeah so um, uh, so uh, again uh, for water yes it is a concern but uh, i i would think that you know we need one or two facilities for this we don't need uh, 30 uh, areas which have this facility so with one or two uh, facilities maybe in uh, uh, in uh, the i know that the types of areas people have been talking about are either hyderabad or there have been talks about this in gujarat as well so uh, those are the areas where people have been talking about not in uh, close to the himalayas at least i have not come across any uh, debates on that but mainly also because you need an ecosystem of people who are working on this already right so for example bangalore hyderabad already have a, a base of people who are working on these areas so it would probably be advantageous to locate in that area uh, so yeah i mean water is a requirement but i, I guess in any part of uh, india if we need one uh, one strategically important industry india would should be able to uh, get over this uh, uh, water requirement right i mean we can uh, do that mm, so that's where i have heard nothing on the himalayas or close to that that i have come across at least okay thank you uh... Pranay, I have a last question, and uh, I wanted to ask. Uh, you know, in February, I read somewhere that uh, uh, when Joe Biden came, he he held a chip and he showed it, and then he signed. Generally, I have never seen uh, that kind of display when you are going to do something and you want to communicate something differently. But he did it, and after that, uh, we have been reading about chip wars, and then people are equating. Though uh, energy war was entirely different, it was partly religious, partly strategic, and and otherwise as well. But uh, what kind of war is this chip war? I mean, I and we want to know if you can throw some light on that. And why would somebody do that kind of display? Do you think the timing after COVID, because technology is going to be, I mean, taking over everything? So what 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 are your thoughts on these two? yeah i mean a uh, great question yeah he, he he displayed the chip and uh, before that the congress also had an act for this which was called chips so uh, i mean some uh, uh, big acro- acronym which essentially means that you need to attract semiconductor companies back to the us so a lot of uh, so as a, there are a few dimensions of this chip war one as i said is uh, us uh, china is probably the Uh, if you think of the technology stack of china one weak link that it has is semiconductors right because it does not have manufacturing facilities of the kind which are there in taiwan or which are even there in the us so on the design s- section they have a few companies now uh, on manufacturing they have trailing edge nodes a few foundries but not like tsmc uh, and on the manufacturing equipment etc they don't have an expertise you know so if you think of strategy being this idea that you need to attack an, an adversary's weak link rather than play on their strong points that's what is happening now so us realizes that china's weak link is this and because is a meta critical technology they would want to uh, develop uh, this faster that's why china is going giving big subsidies since 2014 for this and that's why what uh, us has used this weak link of china to sort of deny companies like huawei sub- access to the leading edge 
uh, semiconductor companies. And that's why the secondary sanctions which have come up, right? So that is one dimension. Uh, again, so Taiwan becomes the center point of this, you know, uh, that's one. The other thing uh, that, that I said is, uh, because this one company is so important, there are a lot of cyber attacks which happen, there are threats that, you know, what happens if this company is taken over or if this company's uh, sort of uh, production lines are brought down and what are the ripples that it leads to geoeconomically across the world, right? So that is the second angle. The third angle, of course, is uh, what I spoke about of, of the espionage side, you know, so uh, hardware espionage, uh, and there are allegations, though not confirmed, about how uh, there are certain chips which were put on motherboard to spy on what is being used in uh, data centers, right? So, uh, again, an access to what other countries intend is can uh, be, uh, can semiconductors be used as a tool for getting that information, you know? So, these are a few dimensions. Uh, through which chip wars are uh, happening. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, you are seeing the geoeconomic implications also of uh, this. Uh, another interesting angle, for example, I told you ASML, that one company which manufactures the uh, equipment. Now, US has also uh, pressured Netherlands to not allow the supply of that to Chinese companies. So Chinese um, foundries, uh, fabs, which wanted to do leading edge development, they are dependent on this one company and US has uh, been able to deny Netherlands uh, from supplying that. Uh, how long that ban remains, we don't know, but they have not been able to do that, supply that leading edge uh, equipment. They are supplying the older equipment there. So, you know, all these countries are getting embroiled in this uh, without, whether they want or not. You know? So that's how I would see it playing. Thank you so much, Pranay, and thank you so much, everyone. And Pranay, you are very generous that we took your uh, more 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and you agreed to it. And uh, one thing that I really liked about this conversation is it is a very complex topic. And for most of us, it was an edu educative experience. We learned about it, we came and we participated and you made everything so simple. So thank you so much for that conversation. Thank you so much, Momita, for asking those questions. And uh, I mean, that's all. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to you to have you on the campus on this topic. I think more and more discussions should happen on this in terms of curriculum, otherwise in the classroom. Uh, this is going to be one of the most significant things which is already there and it is going to shape us in a very different way, particularly in India. So thank you so much everyone for joining and uh, take care and thank you. For